Welcome to Culture, I'm Odette Grober. Thank you for joining me today on our program. We'll hear about a retrospective for artist Jacques Grimbel. A recap of the African MTV Awards. And we'll see some hilarious web series. Jacques Greenberg was a French-Israeli painter, one of the pioneers of the New Figuration movement. A new retrospective of his work is currently on display in the Ein Harod Museum. And with me in the studio is Nimrod Reitman, one of the exhibition's curators. Thanks for coming in, Nimrod. Hello, Dan. How are you? I'm doing wonderfully. I, I want to hear about Greenberg. And, you know, he, he passed away in 2011, and now we see this retrospective. Looking back now that he's no longer in the game, what can we say about his career? Well, on many levels, it's a retrospective, but also a first exhibition. So there is the what, what French philosophy would call an aporia, a paradox, because this is an, an artist that has been has managed to go off the radars of mm -hmm. Israeli and on many levels French criticism out of the scrutiny. And for a very, very interesting reason, because he was always creating some kind of a syncopated uh, movement in terms of his um, artistic sensibilities. And I think that this is where Greenberg becomes interesting. He was always in some kind of a cancer movement ahead and ahead of the curve and also behind, behind of the bit, curve. Yeah. And I think that that's what makes it very, very interesting in terms of the in terms of the work that is being displayed, because this is what, and especially today in the political environment ad hoc and what is happening today, because Greenberg hasn't shied away from displaying a very, very carnal relation mm. to what was never in vogue in terms of relation to figure, relation to carnal display of yeah, bloodiness. Yeah, he definitely had his own uh, uh, way, his own path that he took. Um, you know, I described him as a French-Israeli painter Truth is, he didn't spend that much time in Israel, right? At the age of 23, he left Israel to Paris, came back a couple of times, but never really. Right. However, as we know from philosophy and from poetry, one cannot really disavow the origin. So he was, he, he was born in Bulgaria. However, he was trained here, and mm -hmm. he studied at the Avni Institute, and he paid dividends to... Uh, to Why did he leave initially? He left initially because he felt like many of uh, many of his generations, people like um, Yair Garbus and Mundi and May Vizeltia, that's people who, in the generation that preceded him, people from the New Horizon movement of Hakim mm -hmm. Khadashim, who were his teachers, managed to create some kind of a buffer zone from the wounds and from the woundedness of the tragedy and the catastrophe that has happened. And he wanted to dig into the wound and mm. into the woundedness. Israel was not really the, the site and the it, place right. to do that. So he went, like many artists, many poets, to the place that was the most um, most receptive and on many many on many other aspects the least receptive to this kind of introspection which was Paris at the time and there he went rogue he went completely rogue because he wasn't French however he did have some French sensibilities which were also on the other hand very very Israelis and he immediately came into prominence he was very very successful especially before 1968 he responded very very um, directly to political uh, occurrences uh, in France in Israel, especially between 61 and 68 in France, these are very, very crucial moments, yeah. the Algier Sixth, War yeah. and 68. And he was he managed to display in the most prestigious of Parisian salons. And So what happened? Why did he disappear from the radar, as you put it? Well, in 1968, there has been a shift. There has been the, the student uh, riot, riots. Uh, before that, he was part of the Nouvelle Figuration movement, which was never a movement. Part of the movement was that it could not aggregate into a movement. They were all rogue artists. Mm -hmm. It later, in, in, in its third generation, it became pop art, pop art French right, pop right. art. Which he people, never really... No, people like Adami, who, who became very, very central in, to this day. Uh, people like Jacques Derrida and Nancy has written about them extensively, but... Um, Greenberg started with them, but after 1968, the gallery that represented him went into bankruptcy, and some kind of um, of and the sensibility in terms of the direct relation to um, to political um, 
catastrophes and political yeah. atrocities was also fading in in France. Mm. You should also remember that in France. He kept working though well kept, into the 80s, 90s, he I mean worked until, until the very last day. He worked until two weeks before he passed yeah. away in 2011. His artistic verve kept running, yeah. however it was, uh, and and in, com in complete syncopation with the mm. With, with the audience, he wasn't trying to. Uh, he wasn't to be working for anybody no, else. No, he was himself. working for himself. He yeah. was he was for himself. He was the real deal. He believed in what he was doing. And he had all sorts of influences, all sorts of uh, even spiritual influences. Right. Let's call it right. right. What was uh, he? Well, he was very, very as as starting from the beginning, he was very, very open, and this was something that was completely not. Oh, people were not open to that in Israel, and not really also in France. He was very, very. Uh, he had religious sensibilities. He was open to Kabbalah, and he was open, and and you see it also in terms of his relation to. Um, to Christianity and to Judaism. He has a series of the Twelve Apostles to which he read his own personal acquaintances, the Third Eye, some themes that he read in a completely idiosyncratic way because he wasn't um, he wasn't educated into a mm -hmm. Kabbalistic um, mm -hmm. building. He just he, he had a bit of it and put a, a little bit of that flavor into it. Yes, work. and there was yeah. a very there, there are many many idiosyncrasies which yeah. makes it very very difficult to say okay Jacques Greenberg is, is part this? of a movement. Yeah. It's yeah. it's very it's, he's very difficult elusive, to categorize, yes. but uh, very interesting uh, uh, work I must say. And yes. uh, now we can uh, finally see it. It's about time. Yes. Uh, thanks so much, Nimon. Thank you very very much, Odette. All right. The MTV Africa Music Awards, also uh, known as the MAMAs, were established in 2008 to celebrate the most popular contemporary music in Africa. This year's event saw Nigerian artists take home most of the awards. Let's take a look. We go, go, Monaco, Monaco. Stars of the African music industry flew into KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, for the fifth edition of the MTV Africa Music Awards celebrating and championing African music and youth culture. The event this year took place on the same day as the birthday of Nelson Mandela, July 18, a reminder to artists who attended the event of the important legacy of the late figure. Mandela always taught humility and, and, and in his speech also he said that this land should never ever experience um, the disgusting events of, of discrimination. You know, for, so, you know, just for us to remind ourselves what he taught and, and how we should love each other and how we're one Africa. Mandela's legacy also inspired African-American comedian Anthony Anderson to attend the celebration. To be uh, in the country celebrating uh, such a great man, uh, a great humanitarian, uh, and, and to be a part of that uh, is, uh, is definitely a blessing, and, and that's why I'm here as well. The big winners of the night included flamboyant Nigerian star Yemi Alade, who won the Best Female Artist Award. Best Male Artist Award went to Nigerian-American artist Davido, who was not surprised by his nomination. We'll see, I'm nominated four times. I was nominated four times last year. I went home two. So we'll see what happens this year. South African hip-hop star Casper Njobset got the Best Hip-Hop Album Award. While the Banj won the Mama Evolution Award, a new category honoring established artists who are taking African music to new territories around the world, pushing boundaries of creativity with the shaping of the contemporary soundscape. And although most awards ended up in the hands of Nigerian artists, there is still no doubt that this is a celebration of the entire continent, as the music of the winners is popular among the youth in East and West African countries. Now, how do you help blind people discover painting masterpieces? Well, that's uh, pretty easy, by breaking one of the oldest rules in museums, letting them touch the exhibits, Let's take a look. They can't look, but they can touch. In most museums, the rule is usually the opposite, but not here at the Prado Museum in Madrid. Jose Pedro is blind and is exploring a reproduction of the Velázquez masterpiece Vulcan's Forge with his hands and an audio guide. Things that are in relief are closer to the viewer, and parts that stand out less are further away so you can get an idea of the perspective in the painting. There are six reproductions of great artworks, faithful to the proportions of the original, but specially enhanced for touching. 
It's difficult for a sightless person to build a mental image of the works, so we sort out paintings that contain information but are also clearly understandable. The influential partner charity for the blind behind the exhibition says museums are too often inaccessible to people with disabilities. Universal accessibility makes things easier for everyone. As we always say, anyone can have a disability during their life, even if it is a temporary one. The charity has also set up this museum. Here, visitors can get up close and personal with models of some of the world's most famous monuments. And Madrid's costume museum is also getting on board. This section is especially for the blind, displaying fabrics and clothes from various periods. Touching, smelling and hearing are very important. Since I can't see, I have to make up for it with the other senses. And your hands can teach you a great deal. Since I'm still partially sighted, being able to touch period costumes transports me somewhere else and makes you imagine how other people once lived. Here, visitors can even go one step further by trying on the exhibits and letting their imagination transport them to a royal court. In a moment, we'll uh, laugh along to some uh, web series, hopefully. But uh, first, here's our cultural recommendation for today. The 11th edition Summers of Dance Festival welcomes dancers from the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. On stage at the Theater du Châtelet, no superfluous decoration and no special effects, just dance. In 27 performances, the company founded by the famous African-American choreographer offers a best of his greatest creations, like revelations, but also new choreographies or remakes. Now led by Robert Battle, the dance company tells the moving story of African Americans throughout history. A mix of hip hop, modern dance and ballet, presented some for the first time in France. Shai Ringel is joining me now in the studio to make us all laugh. Go ahead. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> You've put me on the spot here. Um, yeah, we're talking about web, web series. Yeah. And we'll, uh, ha we'll dedicate this segment to women all over the world. Uh, first off, yeah, we'll go to a, a very nice uh, series called Women Inc. Uh -huh. uh, about a world... As in incorporated? Incorporated, about okay. a world where everything is upside down and men are the ones who are being discriminated against mm, and, women, and women control the world and do not understand why they want to, you know, get a uh, good job. But they're, jobs still, but they're and, still in a bikini. Yeah, but they're still in a bikini. Uh, so somehow. <laughs> Let's uh, take a look. Hey, did any of you see the Masculinist Manifesto documentary over at Angelica? Yeah, oh, so unbelievable. Right? I just, I don't see men as leaders, right? I know, it's just that historically, women have always been the leaders. It's like that for a reason. Yeah, besides, how would they lead exactly? Would they point their penis in different directions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's a little funny, but I don't know. Yeah. It's not like men. I, I mean, men, at, at least not in this workplace, wouldn't dare have that conversation. Men sometimes do, will have that conversation. Maybe I'm the sorry. Men you hang yeah, out I'm, with. I'm sorry to say, but it is. There, there are, I've been to some places, some workplaces where 
men actually talks like that. Really? And and the the idea that women are the one who discriminate against men is kind of funny. I think that they are not playing uh, that good. The actors here, uh -huh. who are also the writers and directors, they, is it funny beyond just that thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, funny. It's it's worth, worth checking out. It's worth checking out at least the first episode. Uh, after that, the idea is kind of getting. Yeah, I see. Finished. All right. But what then, else do you have for us? The next series is actually very funny for the entire series it's called bounty hunters uh, and uh, it's where two women are becoming bounty hunters let's see all right you young men sit tight i'm gonna grab some money for you okay betsy what a cute but weird old woman i know listen dad there's no way this sweet but weird old woman has any relation to big daddy now let's get out of here i'm starving mexican sush juice juice what about fresh meat <laughs> Now, this looks funny. I also yeah. like the 80s VHS aesthetics. Yeah. Uh, Shai, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's uh, it from us for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed our show. We'll be back tomorrow with another one. Same as always. So uh, I know I'll be here. Please make sure you do as well.